Good morning, Red Cedar Church, and welcome. On this spring morning, following a, a lovely rain that we so need, it's great to be here and it's great to be outside. Whether you're a first time visitor or a long time member, we're glad you're here this morning, or you're joining us online as well. We're glad that you're with us and welcome. Um, just please note that there are bulletins and music sheets at the back. There have been people passing them out. Uh, if you didn't get one, please get one uh, for this morning. Restrooms and the, the nursery is staffed this morning are available in the building, and you can just use this sidewalk to get into the uh, church from here. As we enter into worship this morning, I want to welcome you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We believe the Lord has brought us together to worship him. So whatever your church background or what you think about who Jesus is, we hope that you meet him and come to know him better this morning. Our call to worship this morning is the gospel message from Title three, Titus 3. It, it reminds us of why we're here. So please listen and uh, understand what, what our Lord has done for us. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out richly on us through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let's stand and worship this great God who has done this for us. One, two, three. <laughs> Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering For there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise When the darkness closes in Lord Still I will say Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. We give and take away, we give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Oh 
nations they fail not as thou hast been now forever wilt be great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see all I have seated. Well, Red Cedar Church family and all who are visiting here with us, welcome. It's good to be with you. We are actually part of a broader network of church families throughout the United States called the Evangelical Free Church of America. Um, even though each church kind of runs independently, we partner together for mission. Uh, we get to equip each other's pastors and learn together in ministry. And uh, we also get to partner financially in helping other churches get up and running uh, throughout the United States and then here in our district, which is the Great Lakes District. Today we're going to be jumping into a reflection on big truths together by looking at the Evangelical Free Church of America's statement of faith. And what I love about our responsive reading this morning, which by the way you can find on your song sheets, so I'm going to, we're going to be reading along together in just a moment. But what I love about this responsive reading is that it emphasizes both a big truth about God and who he is but also a big truth about his plan for us. So would you join me in reading this first article in our responsive reading this morning? The article title isn't in here, but the title is God. So let's read this article together. We believe in one God, creator of all things, holy, infinitely perfect, and eternally existing in a loving unity of three equally divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, having limitless knowledge and sovereign power, God has graciously purposed from eternity to redeem a people for himself and to make all things new for his own glory. 
And now Dennis is going to come and lead us in prayer before this one triune God. Let's bow together in, in prayer to our Lord. Father, we bow before you, thankful for your presence here this morning in our lives and for the eternal promise you've given us through your son, Jesus. We look to that promise as our hope in life. We ask you to lead us to live and proclaim that hope every day. Father, the world around us is full of division and strife. We confess that we can partake and contribute to that division with our own agenda and desire for our own gain instead of for your glory. We can speak in ways that are inflammatory. We can speak partial truths. We can say things that aren't true at all, all in support of what we desire and what we believe. We ask your forgiveness this morning, Lord, for this behavior. Have mercy upon us. Change our hearts, Lord, to refrain from being divisive in our lives with others, from seeking our own status or self-righteousness at the expense of others, and from being either naively optimistic or overly fatalistic. Help us instead, Lord, to gain wisdom to speak the truth in every matter, not a partial truth, not a biased truth, but the complete truth with perspective, with balance, with clarity. Father, help us to show grace, humility, not self-righteousness in bringing the truth to light, always avoiding malice and giving all credit to you as our Lord and Savior. Father, guide us to dis discover and discern truth through reading and meditating on your word. Help us to proclaim and to cling to those clear answers and guidance that Scripture gives on many issues that confront us today. Strengthen our dependence on your word, Father, so we never distort or abandon the clear truth of Scripture for any worldly cause. And for those difficult realities of our world that are not addressed directly in Scripture, help us to discern truth through reading and meditating on your word. These issues are complex for us, Lord, and we hear information and opinions from many different directions. Help us, Father, to weigh those and to ultimately rely even more on your word as our source of truth and the ultimate authority in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can you hear me now? You can, okay. Uh, the last two Sundays, I failed to do this. Kids, ages 4 to 10, you can stay here, but you can also go in there to some great classes that are prepared for you. We also have a nursery back up and running, uh, finally, after all this time, so hallelujah for that, and uh, life is returning to normal bit by bit. Um, uh, speaking of that, next Sunday, right here in this parking lot, um, we're going to be having a cookout, uh, kind of a welcome to the summer, uh, back for um, uh, the, the summer anyway, and the weather looks great so far, so let me encourage you to come. We'll have the, the stuff here, details of that in the bulletin. If you're still kind of making your way out of your cave back to in-person worship, uh, use that Sunday maybe as your time to return so we can actually see your face. It's perfectly safe being outside. Uh, most of us are vaccinated too. There's that going for us as well. So it's time to kind of move our way back uh, in that direction. And then if you really want to be gutsy and uh, join some of us, uh, we're going to be camping together at the um, last weekend in July, uh, not far from here. I think it's like a little over an hour from here. We're actually going to be having two worship services that weekend. That'll be August 1st is the Sunday. We'll have one here, but we'll also have one uh, at the uh, uh, camp out. 
campground area. So if you really want to get to know us below the surface, that's a great place to do that. So um, uh, I look forward to both of those events this summer. Well, it happened this Thursday. Did you notice it? Now, before I answer that mystery question, uh, I'm going to ask, really ask, ask you another question. But before I even ask you that question, I'm going to take a minute and go and do a Bible overview. Ready? So the Bible consists of 66 books. The first 39 are called the Old Testament, the last 27 the New Testament. The first 39 are the Jewish Bible. Jews read that Bible their, their whole life, that's what they know. But have you ever thought about this? The 27 books that follow the Old Testament, they're written by Jews who basically went back to their Jewish Bible and began to answer a mystery question that was on almost every page of the Old Testament. The Old Testament said, I'm bringing you a rescuer. I'm bringing you a rescuer. You're going to be the blessing through which all the nations of the world will be blessed. And these Jews who wrote the New Testament said, we know who it is and we know what he's like and his name is Jesus. That's what the New Testament is all about. So here's back to the other question. What passage in the Old Testament is most frequently quoted in the New Testament? If you had to guess, you know, in fact, interestingly, if you took all of the passages, the Old Testament passages quoted in the New Testament and all the allusions to the Old Testament passages quoted in the New Testament, and you took them out, you wouldn't have much New Testament left. So what passage in the Old Testament is most frequently quoted in the New Testament. Is it a passage about Jesus' virgin birth? The fact that Jesus had to miraculously be born of a virgin, otherwise he wouldn't have been a sinless human being. Is it a passage about the virgin birth? Because there are some passages about that. Is it a passage about Jesus' sinless life? Because if it wasn't for Jesus' sinless life, he could never have been a sinless sacrifice to substitute for us who are sinners. Is it a passage about Jesus' death? I mean, there's lots of Old Testament passages that speak about the death of uh, the suffering servant, right? Is it, is it a passage about his suffering death? No, 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 wait. Is it a passage about his resurrection? The most frequently quoted passage from the Old Testament, quoted in the New, is not about his virgin birth. It is not about his life. It is not about his death. And it is not about his resurrection. It is about his ascension. And it's Psalm 110. We'll eventually get to Psalm 110 this morning. But so what, it, what happened Thursday? Thursday was Ascension Day. Exactly 40 days after Easter. And some church traditions actually celebrate uh, Ascension Sunday. And I'm just curious, I won't take a poll, but I wonder how many of you have been part of a church that celebrates Ascension Sunday. I haven't been. Some of you have. Uh, I wonder how many of you have heard messages on Ascension, on the Ascension. Well, today you're going to hear one, because today's the Sunday following uh, Ascension Day. And uh, I appreciated what one person said, that if you think of it this way, the virgin birth of Christ, his, uh, his sinless life, his sacrificial death, and his physical resurrection are the components of a bomb in which the ascension is the explosion. That's what I hope to at least demonstrate a little bit today. So if you have a Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter 2. There is one place that captures most of the ideas of the ascension in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, verses uh, basically 6 through 9. We'll just be reading uh, a small portion of that. And uh, you're going to get a workout in the Bible today, if you don't mind. Um, and if you can't keep up, that's fine. Uh, but I'll do my best here. So Ascension, or I'm sorry, Hebrews, not Ascension. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6, um, says this. It has been testified somewhere. The somewhere happens to be Psalm 8. He's quoting the Old Testament here. It's Psalm 8. 
It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? And while this is a psalm about someone who goes outside and they look up at the heavens and they say, Lord, uh, why have you made man so important? We're, we're nothing. Uh, we're, we're lower than the angels. And yet it seems to us that we're the very center of your plan, the center of the universe. But he says an interesting phrase there. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? Now, here's the Jewish apostles going back, reading the Old Testament. And they hear that phrase, the son of man. And they know that on one sense, that just means the ideal human being. But in the ultimate sense, it means the Messiah, the ideal human being. So then they, it says in verse 7, You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. And then, if you look down to verse 9, verse 9 of Hebrews 2 is the commentary on Psalm 8. It's specifically the commentary of verse 7. But we see him, speaking about Jesus, we see him who for a little while, meaning his earthly ministry, was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, in case you don't know who I'm talking about, Jesus, crowned with glory and honor. We now see Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of his death. So the first thing we need to know about the ascension is this. The ascension was heaven's coronation of the God-man. It was heaven's coronation of the God-man Jesus. And uh, he no longer is, is in his state of being a little lower than the angels. He's now crowned with glory and honor. He, he, the end of, this is the end of the, Jesus' earthly limitations. After the resurrection, you might remember, Jesus appeared for 40 days to different crowds in different ways. And they recognized him, and he definitely had what we would call um, enhanced powers. But when Jesus ascended, it was the end of his earthly limitations. He was still very much a physical human being. But if we saw Jesus after his ascension, his glory would be unbearable. It wouldn't be just like seeing Jesus after the resurrection. We would see Jesus like he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. In fact, if you want to get a good picture of what the ascended Jesus looked like compared to his earthly limited self, you can compare his resurrection appearances to Revelation chapter 1, where John, the Apostle John, sees Jesus again in his ascended state after having been with him in his resurrected state. Toward the end of his life, he sees a vision of Jesus in his ascended state, and John says he falls to his feet like a dead man. He has this unbearable glory. In a sense, we could say it this way. The servant has become the prince. And so the first thing to know about the ascension is it was, the, it was heaven's coronation of the God-man. But even more than that, probably the richest part of the ascension is in the rest of this passage in Hebrews chapter 2. Let's read, let's keep reading after verse 7. After Jesus being crowned with glory and honor, it says in verse 8, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Well, what does that mean? Well, thankfully we have a commentary. It goes on to say, now in putting everything in subjection to him, he, meaning the Father, left nothing outside of his, Jesus' control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to Jesus. Get that. Right now, we, it's true. We don't see the whole world in subjection to Jesus. But don't let your eyes fool you. We do see him who for a little while, verse 9, was made lower than angels, crowned with glory and honor. And then it goes on to describe how the whole world is subjected to Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about through the rest of this message. There's at least four ways that the Father has put everything in subjection to Jesus. If I can put it this way, if his ascension was heaven's coronation of the, of the God-man, even more important, it was the commencement of Jesus as king. It was the beginning of his reign, as it were, as king. The crown king reigning is what the ascension is all about. This is the time of year we hear that word commencement. And... Um, and uh, even as some of us were riding our bikes uh, across uh, campus uh, a couple days ago, uh, we saw these 
graduates walking with their robes and kind of jokingly said, yeah, it's just beginning for them. <laughs> you know, this isn't the end. This is just the beginning. Uh, and that's really what graduation is. It's commencement in that sense. So there's at least four things that I see in the commencement of Christ's reign. One, he is subduing his enemies. Uh, number two, he's empowering his family. Uh, number three, he's beautifying his bride. And finally, he's preparing a place. And so we're just going to uh, work our way through these, spending more time on some than others. So first of all, we see that Jesus is subduing our enemies, putting uh, everything in subjection in his feet. He's subduing uh, the enemies of the church, the enemies of the kingdom, which means every force of evil in the world and not just forces of evil, but also people of evil, evil ones as well. The Father's reward to Jesus after he lived a sinless life and became a sacrificial a substitute for us, the Father's reward to Jesus was to give all the kingdoms of the world into his hand. Here, sit beside me and rule the universe. That's what uh, the Father did for the Son. And we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm going to read this backwards, not because that's my recommendation to you, but because it actually works better in this particular case. I'm not going to read the words backwards. I'm just going to go up from the verses. Um, so 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 27 says this. For God has put all things in subjection under Jesus' feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. In other words, Jesus isn't uh, subjected in that sense. And then, and then as we work our way backward, verses 25 and 26, he must reign, he's currently reigning, he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So understand this, we aren't waiting for the day when Jesus will put all things under his reign. We're in the day when Jesus is putting all things under his reign. And then in verse 24, then comes the end, listen to this, then comes the end when Jesus delivers the kingdom of God to the Father, the kingdom to God the Father after, after destroying every rule, authority, and power. So he is currently right now reigning over the earth. And then Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians is a book we're going to be uh, in a handful of times today, but Ephesians chapter 1 says this, Verse 20, after speaking about this immeasurable greatness of the power that the Father exercised in order to raise the Son from the dead, it says this, He worked this in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places. So, Think about it this way. God had to raise Jesus and seat Jesus in order for Jesus to commence his reign. Again, he's, uh, it's all about subduing his enemies, uh, and that's why there's an interesting uh, situation that happens in the Gospels with the, uh, the apostles. They finally get this. It takes them a while, but they finally get this. In John chapter 14, Jesus says to him, let not your hearts be troubled. And why are their hearts troubled? Because Jesus kept telling them, I'm going to die and I'm going to leave you. And that, was, that made them sorrowful. It goes, the text goes on to say they were sorrowful when they heard about that. Then in Acts chapter 1, it says they returned to Jerusalem with joy. How did their sorrow get turned into joy? How did they come to accept the fact that it was good for Jesus to uh, get out of here, to depart from them? Well, I think they began to understand why Jesus had to leave. Uh, they began to understand what Jesus was doing. So when we celebrate the reality of the resurrection, we're entering into that joy of the apostles who realized Jesus had to leave in order to be seated, in order to commence his reign. If he stayed, he, his reign could not be commenced. And that's what I think they began to, it began to dawn on him. So maybe I could put it this way. When we celebrate Easter... What we're really doing is we're celebrating the past and to some extent the future. We're celebrating the fact that Jesus died 
and that he rose from the dead, which gives us hope for the future. But when we celebrate the ascension, we're celebrating the present. We're celebrating the progress that Jesus is making as he rules as king over the universe. So in one sense, the ascension is profoundly more important to celebrate than Easter. So just give that, put that in your sort of bucket and let's just have some homework. And maybe next year, let's just blow out the walls in a, an ascension celebration. I'll just give that to you guys as homework. Um, I think there's a reason why Jesus said more than once, he looked at his disciples and he said, don't you get it? He, he says, I tell you the truth. Kings and prophets wanted to see what you see and hear what you hear. I mean, don't you see? All of the Old Testament is waiting for this moment. Not just my death, not just my resurrection, but at last the commencement of my reign. So, uh, he is subduing our enemies. One application of just that idea, every day, every single day, before this day is over, more of Jesus' enemies will be subdued. It doesn't even matter whether you believe that. That's true. Uh, more of Jesus' enemies will be subdued. In fact, more of our enemies if you belong to Jesus. We need to remember we live with enemies. There are people that hate Jesus. They hate the kingdom. And by the way, this is their turf. And every so often their consciences get pricked and they realize they're losing and we need to take that into consideration. We need to have our guard up. As C.S. Lewis is famous for saying, uh, Satan will get you to swallow a lake of truth if it has a cup of poison in it. And that cup of poison is put in there by people. There are actual people that are the enemies of the kingdom. And I know that's a very unpopular idea. Jesus says in Matthew 18, in fact, our, the elders are working our way through uh, portions of Matthew right now. And we just went over this passage the other day. In Matthew 18, Jesus says, Woe to the world, because uh, in the world there are temptations. Uh, but then he goes on to say, But woe to the one through whom those temptations come. It would be better for their arm to be cut off than for them to be that kind of person. He doesn't just say that there's forces in the world. There's actual enemies that are people in this world. But here's the fascinating thing. The primary way Jesus is subduing our enemies right now is not through removal, it's through conversion. Which is why we don't have permission to take vengeance. Because when we take vengeance, it doesn't leave room for God to, to do conversion work. Um, and listen to 1 Corinthians uh, 6, the way he, he puts it here. 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he goes on to, to define the unrighteous. These, now, he's going to define the unrighteous by their behaviors, but keep this in mind. He's not saying that if you do these behaviors, you're automatically unrighteous. He's saying, he's describing people who refuse to have their consciences awakened, who consistently practice these kinds of behaviors. So let me read it. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. There are enemies of God that he will one day remove who, are not, who refuse to be converted. But you know what I love about this text? It doesn't stop there. And such were some of you. And such were some of you. But you were, and listen to these past tense, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, you were all enemies. I was, all, I was an enemy of Jesus. And he conquered us, he subdued us through uh, conversion. So that's what he's up to right now. He is subduing his enemies. The, the second thing he's doing, he is empowering his family. Uh, he's, he's empowering his family, the church. By the way, 
If God's empowering us, it implies that we're suffering from weakness. It implies that we're suffering from weakness. Uh, do you remember that story uh, when uh, Mary, one of the, one of the Marys is um, confronting Jesus after he's resurrected and she's clinging to him? And Jesus says, stop clinging to me. I have to ascend to my father. And it wasn't that Jesus had a body that they weren't, she wasn't supposed to touch because it was a resurrection body. That had nothing to do with it. What Jesus was saying to her is, Mary, I'm not sticking around. Don't keep clinging to me. I know this is hard to believe, Mary, but I'm back from the dead, but you're better off if I'm not here. Really? Yes, Mary, it's better if I leave. Because if I leave, this is what's going to happen. Uh, look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 is actually in your bulletin there. This is the main passage uh, on the uh, ascension. In Acts chapter 1, um, just a couple observations. That's all we're going to make of this. Luke is writing to Theophilus in verse 1. Notice this. I, uh, in the first book, meaning his gospel of Luke, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. And we should stop there for a second. He doesn't say, I dealt with all that Jesus did. He doesn't say, I dealt with all that Jesus did. Luke says, Theophilus, I'm writing to you about what Jesus began. Not what he did, what he began. He started something. And then he goes on to say, verse 2, until the day he was taken up after giving commands through the Holy Spirit to the, to the apostles, he presented himself alive to them after suffering many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. What was Jesus speaking about during those 40 days? The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. You guys, you don't really understand the kingdom of God. Let me tell you what I'm about to begin here. I'm about to begin my reign as the king over my kingdom. And then he goes on um, in verse 6. When they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They still didn't get it. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. In other words, the how and when... They're in the Father's hands. But the what? That's in your hand. The how and the when? That's in the Father's hand. But what to do right now? That's in your hands. And so he goes on to say, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You're going to be given power, and here's what you're supposed to do. Witness for me. Brian spoke on this a few uh, weeks back. Uh, right here in this text, in this one little text in verse 8, we have the means, the mission, and the scope of the kingdom of God. The means, the mission, and the scope of the kingdom of God. What Jesus did in the ascension is he passed the baton to the church. Listen again to uh, Ephesians chapter 1, the text we just read, um, that I'll read a little bit more of. Uh, Ephesians 1.21 1 says that, after seating him in the right hand of the heavenly places, he's far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. In other words, there's nothing higher than Jesus over which he reigns. He reigns over everything. But then, notice this. He put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. How does Jesus rule the universe? Through the church and no other way. Jesus does not rule the universe outside of the church, indirectly from the church, but only and exclusively through the church over which he is the head. Uh, he has passed the baton entirely to the church, and it's almost like a tag team. Jesus ascended to heaven, seated on the throne, the Holy Spirit took the baton came down to the earth, and every single convert gets the Holy Spirit. And so better to have a gazillion flawed Jesuses than one perfect physically present Jesus. That's the whole idea. Yes, that's a better strategy. Not in my mind, but in the King of Kings' mind. That is the strategy here. And uh, so, and you can keep reading it. By the way, do you know the other passage that's uh, most frequently, the second most frequently quoted passage? In the New Testament, it's Psalm 69. It's quoted in Ephesians 4, among other places. 
And it's all, it's the idea of the, the king uh, gaining victory and the spoils of victory are the gifts of the spirit that he gives to human beings. So again, it's all about the ascension, all about Jesus commencing his reign. So again, another, another idea of this, which is found right here in Ephesians. Listen to this, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Jesus was raised, uh, listen, or it says of us, sorry, it says of us. Of you and I as believers. When Jesus was raised, verse 6 of Ephesians 2, you were raised. When Jesus was seated, guess who was seated? You were seated. Jesus' resurrection, your resurrection. Jesus' ascension, your ascension. Jesus' reign, your reign. That's the whole idea here over and over again. So what's true of the head flows to the feet. We are reigning with him and he is reigning through us. Whether we're soaring and even when we're nosediving, Jesus is still reigning through us. In fact, quite honestly, I won't be surprised in a few years when I see him. I won't be surprised if the time that he's been reigning the most in me is when I feel like I'm failing the most. In fact, Tim Keller makes an interesting um, comment on Matthew 11. You just, you got to hear this. Matthew 11, have you ever, some of you have read this before and you thought, wow, that's a weird, that's a weird comment by Jesus. I wonder what it means. Jesus says this, truly I say to you, Matthew 11, verse 11, among those born of women, which would be a lot of people, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Really? Wow, that's a huge compliment by Jesus. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he? Hold on a second. Who is in the kingdom of heaven in this room? Everyone who belongs to Jesus is greater than John the Baptist, and he was the greatest of all the prophets. How does that work out? And by the way, he doesn't just say, if you're in the kingdom of heaven and you're bearing lots of fruit, you're greater than John the Baptist. He says the least in the kingdom of heaven. And what Tim Keller does that makes a, a beautiful point about this is he says that if it's true of the least, that even the, the least is greater, it, it points again to the fact that Jesus is reigning and it points again to the brilliance of his, his, his ascension. Let me put it this way. Think about everybody before Jesus began his reign as boat builders. They're all building the boat. Some of them are better boat builders than others, and apparently John the Baptist was the best boat builder. But when Jesus came along, the boat was launched, and wind was put in the sails of the boat. And according to this, if you're on the boat, if you're in the kingdom, it means this, that even the weakest, most inefficient effort contributes wind to the sails. Why is that and how is that? Because Jesus has ascended. And he has an amazing ability to empower the weakest of things to do amazing work. And so this should give us courage to keep carrying our cross. This should give us courage. This, by the way, for me, was my biggest application for me personally uh, from preparing this message, uh, is to get my eyes off of myself in the battle and get them on the champion who's already at the top of the hill and says, hey, you're going to make it. It's going to be okay. And so whether you're a parent for Jesus or you're a plumber for Jesus or you're a professor for Jesus, it doesn't matter. Whatever you are for Jesus, because of Jesus, it counts. That's the whole idea here. Your struggle, your sense of futility, all of that counts. So Jesus is subduing our enemies. He's empowering his family. He is beautifying his bride. He's beautifying his bride. In Ephesians chapter 5, we are told that uh, Jesus is committed to removing every single blemish in his bride, the church. <laughs> and um, uh, it's the same idea of him pruning the vineyards. It's the same idea in James chapter 1 and Hebrews 12 that our trials are refining us. Uh, and it's true that the church has always been criticized throughout the ages. 
And by the way, there's a lot of criticism that we deserve, and there's a lot of criticism that we should own. And there's hardly a story in the church that doesn't have some negative uh, component to it. But the point is, is that even in the midst of the negatives, Jesus is creating something that is beautiful. Can I, let me just give you one illustration on this point. I'm going to use church history to try to illustrate this point of how Jesus is doing beautiful work in his church and through his church. So last Sunday, uh, I know most of you remember this, uh, it was the death of Nicholas von Zinzendorf, one of your favorite people. Uh, and you know that he's... It's, he wasn't just Nicholas von Zinzendorf, he was Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf. Now, the reason he's important isn't really because of Zinzendorf. It's because of uh, something that happened 400 years before that. You see, there were a bunch of people in the Czech Republic who realized that something was wrong with the institutional church. They had lost their way and they had, re they had lost contact with uh, the scriptures. And so these group of people, these Hussites, began to study the scriptures. They eventually grew to be 170,000 people, at which point the institutional church, not being quite so pretty at the time, uh, did something uh, atrocious. Over the course of a whole generation, they wiped them out until 170,000 were down to 36,000. Those 36,000 couldn't stay in the Czech Republic, and they finally had to flee the Czech Republic to Germany, where at the same time, God had been working on this incredibly wealthy count who realized he didn't want to just live his life in kind of a Jane Austen world, but instead, sorry about that, uh, he actually wanted to do something with his wealth. And so he established this estate for these refugees, these Moravian refugees uh, from the Czech Republic, and essentially created the first Christian village. Now, here's one of the most amazing things about this. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, ugly things happened in that village, things that were typical of any time you put a bunch of sinners together, it's going to happen. Uh, that's, not, that's not news. But out of that ugliness came the beauty of Jesus at work. And this was the first time that we know of. It's probably not the first time in history. It's only the first time we know of in recorded history where a whole church decided to take on the project of global missions. Not just sending out one or two designated missionaries with a society, but the whole church, every single person, pledging themselves to be part of global missions. And so two people went to the Virgin Islands to start uh, a ministry. And you're thinking, oh man, I'd love to go to the Virgin Islands for Jesus. The Virgin Islands in the 1700s were not a tourist trap. They were a slave trap. They were willing to sail all the way across the Atlantic to reach slaves. No one was reaching slaves for Jesus. So two men went. And after a year and a half of incredible work and incredible persecution, because these were white men trying to reach these slaves, someone came to Jesus. And they brought that person back to this community in Germany. And they were all startled and amazed at the story. And so not long after that, 13 more people, four women, and uh, whatever that, the math is on that, the rest are men, um, traveled to the Virgin Islands. Seven months on a boat in a 10-foot square room where they spent the majority of their time. Needless to say, their immune systems were significantly compromised. And after less than seven months, eight of the total 14 that went back died. Not long after that news reached Germany that almost half, more than half the party had lost their lives within six months. So 11 members of the congregation decided to go. Not stay, go. And they said, we'll be smart this time. We'll send a doctor. So they sent over a doctor. Of the 11 that went, within less than a year, six died, including the doctor. And it went on and on. Fourteen years later, there was a church there of over 400 saved slaves. And you know, that is just one of thousands of stories that I know 
There must be 10 to 20,000 more that are recorded out there. And there has to be hundreds of thousands of such stories being told over and over again in eternity right now by all the angels that are just cheering like crazy. Jesus is committed to taking this ugly thing called his church and doing beautiful things through her. And finally, just a minute on this. He's preparing a place right now. John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. Boy, must be quite a place if he's still preparing it, right? Uh, I go to prepare a place for you. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus was physically taken up into heaven. Now think about this. I know this is a little bit probably a, a little out there for some of you, but it's actually right here in the text in many places. In Hebrews chapter 13, it's told, in this world, you may actually be entertaining angels and not even knowing it. Now put all this together. Jesus went to prepare a place for us. We're going to get a physically resurrected body. He left us physically. He must have gone to some kind of place that needed a physical body. Angels appear to us in physical forms. That means that Jesus is not somewhere else right now. He's in this physical place right now, reigning. It's just that we can't see him because these are the shadow lands in which we live. And what he's doing in his reign, if I can put it this way, he's not only preparing a place for us when we die and when he returns, or to put it better, when the shadows go away and we see that he's been here all along. But if he's reigning right now, that means that as you walk by faith, you will actually pick up on Jesus physically here with us Right now, the longer you walk with him. Just something to chew on. He's preparing this place for us. And he's not going to do it in the future. He's present tense doing it right now. That's why Jesus says, this is a great comfort in John 14. He says, I wouldn't have lied to you. I wouldn't have lied to you. I go to prepare a place for you. So Jesus' ascension is him subduing his enemies uh, him beautifying his bride, him empowering his people, and right now in this place, preparing it for us. I want to end by reading Psalm 110. <laughs> and after I read it, I'm going to pray. I'm going to do something a little different today. Instead of announcements, I'm just going to give you that space of announcement to take a minute and reflect while Peter and the team play, and then they'll lead us into the closing song. I want to read to you Psalm 110 from the version of the message. The message is uh, a translation by Eugene Peterson. And interestingly, G Eugene says of Psalm 110 that this is the only place in the Bible. The reason I think it was quoted so much is because in the Old Testament, you were either, you could, there were kings and there were priests, but a king could not be a priest and a priest could not be a king. And do you know what Psalm 110 is all about? The combination of the two. The promise of God to send a king who will also be a priest forever. And we know who that priest is. And Peterson said what took the apostles so long to figure this out is here was a king without a palace and here was a priest without a temple. And a king rules and a priest saves. A, a king deals with horizontal relationships. Uh, a priest deals with a vertical relationship. A king gives structure to life, and a priest gives life to structure. So listen to Psalm 110. The word of God to my Lord, sit alongside me here on my throne until I make your enemies a stool for your feet. You were forged a strong scepter by God of Zion. Now rule those surrounded by enemies. Your people will freely join you resplendent in holy armor on the day of your conquest. Join you at the fresh break of day. Join you with all the vigor of youth. God gave his word, and he won't take it back. You're the permanent priest, the Melchizedek priest. The Lord stands true at your side, crushing kings in his terrible wrath, handing out convictions wholesale, bring, bringing judgment on the nations, crushing opposition across the white earth. The kingmaker put his king on the throne. 
the true king rules with his head held high. Lord Jesus, what a honor it is for us to address you today as king. We have been under your reign now for 2,000 plus years. Oh, if we could only see the progress and sweep of history from your perspective. Cheer us, I pray, with this news that you are reigning. And soon, every molecule of evil in us and in this world will be removed. And the tale that seems like a fairy tale will finally and forever and permanently come true. To which we praise you, King of over, over all kings. Amen. Let's stand and join our voices together, singing to the reigning king. Every 
chain this salvation in your name jesus christ my living home then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave have no claim on me then came the morning to seal the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave It's grip on me you have broken every chain this salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain this salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope jesus christ my living hope oh god you are my living hope amen what a great way to uh i didn't intend that closing song apparently someone else did uh it's a perfect ending as we think about uh this morning that um, we can go in the name of our living hope. He's not just because he rose from the dead, but because he is right now doing something. And you all know what that is, right? So um, uh, let us go then in the name of the one who's uh, taken the grip of death off of us, in the name of the one who's a very much alive hope and all God's people said, amen. <laughs>